Sean has been a, working uh, as a professional actor in theater and film and TV and voiceovers for over 25 years, and he's done everything from Shakespeare to being the host of HGTV's Old Homes Restored, and he's recorded over 640 audiobooks. Uh, Sean also created Sean Pratt Presents, which is dedicated to teaching, motivating, and inspiring actors on a variety of topics related to the business side of the acting industry. And, and, and I know we're supposed to be talking about creating great resumes, but um, I am sure that people are going to want to know more about recording audiobooks first. So I wanted to ask if you would be able to explain to people what, what exactly is an audiobook and what's the process of how people can get involved with that? Well, um, basically, uh, an audiobook is, uh, is long-form narration, if you think of it that way. Uh, you know, I, um, I received the book from the producer, the audio producer, and I primarily, almost exclusively do unabridged audio. So if you give me Moby Dick, I have to read the entire, <laughs> from Call Me Ishmael right to the very end. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting, I, I love it. I love being an audio narrator. I work at home, and I uh, have the opportunity to, uh, work on some really interesting material that I never would have picked up on my own. Um, but the uh, the audiobooks themselves, it's a really wonderful industry. It's It's been growing exponentially over the last 10 years with the advent of audible.com, um, with the Internet itself. And more and more, audio narrators are working from their homes. They're building their own studios, using their own equipment and um, then being hired to, to work on audiobooks. And, uh, how do you, I think how do you find, excuse me, how do you find somebody uh, that is looking for talent to record? Well, there's a couple of websites out there. There's one called ACX, those are the letters, A is in Apple, C is in Charlie, X is in X-Ray, dot com, and it's the Audio cre uh, Creative Exchange, and where that, that's where people who want to get into audiobooks are married up to writers and publishers who want backlist titles to be recorded. Now that's a really good first step for people to get in the industry and to explore what it's like to actually do an audiobook. I, I would tell your listeners, um, for those who are thinking about taking the plunge, this is my standard line I give them, uh, anyone who approaches me about doing audiobooks, which is as follows. Um, if you're really interested, then uh, tomorrow when you get up, walk over to your bookcase, shut your eyes, reach out and grab a book you don't get to choose, and then take that book and go sit somewhere quiet and read out loud for three hours. Every time you stumble, stop, back up and start the sentence again. If you hit a word you don't know how to pronounce, stop and look it up. You don't get to guess. Read out loud for three hours a day for about two weeks, and if you're still interested, then you then give me a, give me an email and then we will talk. But it, it's it's you know there, there's a great deal of temperament involved in doing this. You know you, to sit in a little box all by yourself and speak, um, it requires a, a, a different kind of uh, performance temperament I think than getting in front of a live audience. Now when you're doing different characters, do you actually change the pitch? I mean if you if you're going from a male character to to a female character, how do you deal with that? Well, yes, I do. That's the short answer is yes. You 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 play around with your voice, and um, I'm one of the lucky ones. My voice, as a man, I have a fairly young sounding voice, and I can do women and children pretty easily, as opposed to I have friends who, you know, they all sound they might sound like the guy who does the film at eleven voice or the monster truck show voice, and they have a lot harder time <laughs> doing those kinds of roles. But the um, uh, yeah, you're you're playing with all the different you're, you're, you know you're mimicking you know you're you have uh, you're li always listening to people the way they speak, and you're logging in those the way they phrase their sentences, the tones, the pitch, the the tempo, and all those things to play around with. And of course, you have accents, regionalisms. You know, is this person from Scotland? Is this person from Scarsdale, Arizona? You know, you're always playing around with those things too. And that's something that you would be required to be able to do then. Yes, and, but you know, here's the thing too, um, Aaron, is that a lot of people, when they think of audiobooks, they naturally think of fiction, you know, uh, murder mysteries or pieces of fiction. But the truth is, there's just as much nonfiction work out there. I do a great deal of books that are business books, books on psychology, sociology, uh, biographies. Um, I'm getting ready to do a book about uh, the current state of politics in Israel. I'm just wrapping up a book on time management. 
I'm going to be doing a book on um, uh, about Richard Branson, a biography of uh, Richard Branson from Virgin Atlantic. So there's a lot of other work out there, and and in that case, the most important voice to find is your own voice. Learning to be able to be so comfortable in front of the microphone that the listener, it almost sounds to the listener as if the words are just coming out naturally from and spontaneously from you as opposed to being read off a page. And, and without going into like all the technical details, to be able to do this on your own in your home, is there like a general ballpark idea of what, what it would actually cost to have the proper equipment and, and you know, sound muffling uh, um, right. things to, to really make this thing work? Well, it's funny you should say that. Um, I'm, um, I teach uh, audiobook workshops in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, and um, <clears throat> uh, one half of the class is a technique class, and the other half of the class I partner up with another uh, narrator or two, and uh, one gentleman, a man named Craig Klein, does a class with me on how to build your home studio on a budget, meaning how to put it all together for, say, um, and I'm just talking, I'm not talking about necessarily the computer part, but the baffling, the, you know, the sound equipment and so on, probably for a couple of thousand dollars. It's not as expensive as it used to be, and, um, but it just needs, you just need a little bit of information about what kind of microphone you're looking for, the software, how to soundproof a small area so that you, you create an area that's, that doesn't have a lot of noise to it and keeps a lot of noise out. It's actually, it's not that expensive. The, the real trick, Aaron, is learning to use the, the equipment, learning to understand how to use uh, Audacity or Pro Tools or GarageBand, the, the uh, audio um, recording equipment itself, and then learning microphone technique. And that just takes practice. It's really sort of the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hour rule. You know, you, if you're not, it's like learning to play a musical instrument. You've got to be willing to practice every day. So, because the bar is set pretty high, you know, the people who do this all full time, whether it's audio books or in your case, professional, you know, commercial modeling, there's, there's a real um, uh, learning curve there. And you have to meet that curve with practice. And it just takes time. You have to be patient and you have to be focused on it. And is there, how does it work, because people have no idea, I mean, do you get paid, you know, by the page, um, or is it, do you just oh, get actually, a contract? Um, actually, uh, generally speaking, you're paid by what's called the finished hour. Now, what that means is, if they give me a book, and the book is going to, you know, when it's all finished recording, it's, say, it's 10 hours long, and let's say my fee is $200, so $200 times 10 hours, it's a $2,000 book, but you get paid by the finished hour. So if it takes me three to four hours of work to create one finished hour of material, then you can see that you actually spent four hours to earn the $200. So you're making, you know, $50 an hour. Um, and I'm just sort of pulling these numbers out of the air. Here. Yeah. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, when I first started narrating uh, 16 years ago, my ratio was about four to one. And I was only making about $100 a finished hour. Now... 16 years and 650 books later, my ratio is about two to one, maybe one and a half to one when I'm really on my game, and I get paid twice that much. So you can see to really make money in the industry, it's about focus, and it's about just learning how to be comfortable with the equipment and not having your lips fall off your face when you're stumbling <laughs> through very difficult passages. Um, but I love it. I, I think if you, you know, people have a talent, if you've got a knack for storytelling, if you enjoy reading aloud, um, if you don't mind sitting in the little box all by yourself, I think it's a wonderful <laughs> avenue for performers to explore. I really do. <laughs> okay, well, that, that that is actually that's very interesting. But let me move on now to to resumes. Um, okay. Basically, I think it would be helpful for people to know what does a resume, what does it do for the actor? What is the purpose of having a resume? Okay. Well, the the first the, the first thing to think about a resume and your picture, which is on the other side of your resume, is that your picture and resume are both a piece of advertising. Okay. You have this photograph on the front. That's that's what the product and service. That's what you, the widget, looks like. The resume on the back side is a description of what that thing does, right? Or what it has done, or could potentially do. But even so, the resume, first and foremost is not a, uh, 
uh, what do they call it, a, uh, circum, uh, your, your CV, as they would say in the professional world, listing every single thing you've ever done. That's not what a resume does. A resume is a piece of advertising, all right? Um, what I tell uh, actors when they're starting out is what they need to create first and foremost on their computer is a file that I call the master resume. And the master resume will contain every single fact, uh, bit of information they can think of that might might be relevant uh, to them as an actor. List, they list all their plays or movies or commercials or classes they've taken, uh, all their special skills, all their, their, their stats and so on. This resume won't ever see the light of day. It's just a repository of information. It's an archive. The thing that they need to think about an actor um, is even if you're starting out, is to build a resume for each audition in relation to the project they're going into audition for. For instance, if I'm going to audition for a movie, obviously I'll be pulling my movie and TV credits on the resume first and let that see how much space that takes up on the resume. And then if I have space left over, then I add other things. I might add some theater. I might, you know, and, and if I also find out perhaps that uh, this particular movie, they're looking for people who um, have experience, say, uh, doing stunt driving or, or mil military background, I might list the fact that I have a top secret security clearance or that I, I'm a licensed driver or that I've taken a, a course um, on firearm safety. Once again, it's all about you look at the information you've collected about yourself on the master resume. You look at the project you're going to audition for, and then you begin to pop, pull off information from the master resume and build that new resume in relation to the project. So if they see my picture and they go, oh, yeah, we, you know, a tall redheaded guy might be interesting for this part, and they flip it over, all the information they're about to read will be designed to help them see me in the light for that particular role. I leave off the things that, that are not relevant. Because what usually happens there, and I'm sure you've seen this a million times, is that actors overfill their resume. And so it becomes this big jumble of information. That, so the relevant stuff is hard to pick out. So basically, you customize your resume for the audition. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can go even further with that. Um, uh, one of the things I also teach in my, my resume workshop is um, a thing called uh, the use of photographs on the back side of the resume. I, I strongly recommend that if actors, uh, um, for instance, let's, let's go with uh, this idea that I'm ad auditioning for a movie and, and let's say they're looking for actors who have, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an army movie, you know, say the, the new Bruce Willis movie is coming to town, some kind of army CIA shoot 'em up action picture. Well, if I'm about to read for, let's say, the role of a captain in the army, and it just so happens that I have a photograph of me from a training film I did, uh, you know, some months back of me in an army uniform with my pack on and my weapon and all that stuff. And while I was on the set that day, I had them take some shots of me. I can incorporate that photograph into the back side, say into the bottom right-hand corner of the resume, of me in uniform, you know, ready to go. It looks like I could step out of that picture and be walking patrol in Afghanistan, say, or wherever. But the point is that image acts as what is known as an anchor, all right? It, it, the, the, the viewer is already looking at me as a possible soldier for the project. They flip it over, and there I am, dressed as a, as a soldier, ready to go. And like it or not, that, that photograph then acts as a mental anchor uh, for that person. So when they think Sean Pratt, they think, oh, yeah, he's the guy who looks like a soldier. And I'm already one step closer to influencing their judgment as to whether or not I could get the part. Now, when you were talking about statistics, what are your thoughts about people putting their age or their address on their resume? I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, those are two big no-nos. Um, <clears throat> as far as information to put on the back of the resume, say personal information, you should never put your home address and you should never put uh, your home phone number on the back of your resume. At the most, if you do want to put an address down, have a P.O. box. All right? They're not expensive, and they're a tax deduction, by the way. Um, and secondly, you should just have your cell number uh, or your agent's number or your manager's number if you have one. Um, but if you're on your own without an agent or manager, at the very least, you should have your cell phone number and a, um, an email address. And while I'm thinking about it, your email address needs to be 
a simple derivation of your name. It should be, you know, Aaron Marcus at AOL.com or Sean Pratt at Comcast.net, not, you know, Sean will be a famous actor, Pratt, at, you know, <laughs> or I, I, had a, I, had, I coached an actress uh, several years ago. She was right out of college, and her, her email address on the back of her resume was sassybritches at gmail.com. <laughs> And I said, I said, how am I supposed to, you want to be a classical actress, how am I supposed to take you seriously if you've got sassy britches on here? Get that off right now. So I, um, and also the age thing too, I, I generally do not put my age on there because, as you well know, Aaron, that, that in this business you are only as old as, the, as you look or only as old as the, as the cast around you. I always use the the TV show Nine, uh, Beverly Hills 90210 as a perfect example because when that show was, was being produced, all those, quote, high school kids were all in their mid to late 20s, but they were all, the, uh, all in their mid to late 20s, and so visually that created the, the meme that everybody who's supposedly 18 on the show looks like this, and then the viewer you know, uses their suspension of disbelief, and they, they buy into it. So I never you know, played for I was just going to say for phone numbers, something else that, that uh, can be very helpful for people is that you can go to Google Voice and actually get a phone number and it's free and basically what happens is people will use that on their resume and when people call the Google Voice number, it will forward to your cell phone and so that way you don't even have to give out your personal information there. That's a that's a wonderful idea. I'm going to steal that and start telling my students that. So that's great. Feel free. Now, if you want to quote me yeah, on that, that would be great too. But you don't have to. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, that's really good. I, so, right, guys, right. we've got some we've got some we've got some questions from our students. I know we're running out of time. But I want to get some things, Sean, if you don't mind. Um, hey, people Joel, were asking if you could just yeah, go ahead. I, I just wanted to jump in because one thing that that I think is just really really important, and then we'll get to the questions. Sean, if you would be able to just quickly talk about the different categories as far as whether you should be listing yourself as a lead or a co-star or supporting. Could you just explain what those things mean? Oh, sure. Um, you're talking about once you've actually done the job and you're trying to... Correct. Your and, and you want to okay. show everybody what your right. position was. Um, well, the, 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 the quick and dirty method of it is, you know, when you're actually, to me, I always think, if you're on, when you're on set working, or on the commercial shoot, go ahead and ask the producer or ask the script, you know, the director, and like, ask them how they would categorize this role. That would be the first thing I would do, and maybe you could even talk with your manager or agent. Obvi you know, there's there's a fine line between a cameo and an over five, you know, or an under five. Um, there's, you know, is it, you know, so many scenes make you a guest star? It's some of these terms are fairly loose, and when I feel uh, what I've done in the past is when I'm when I'm working on set, I'll actually go up and talk with the producer or the script writer or the director and say, how would you categorize this role? Would you, you know, for that very reason, because sometimes I'm not sure. You know, when I, I did um, an episode of, of The District, um, it was a guest starring role because I was in a certain number of scenes and they were nice, big, chunky scenes. And so I, and I asked the producer, he said, oh, no, this is a guest starring role. You know, but when I did um, The Mail Room Clerk on New York Undercover years ago, that was obviously an over five, you know, and that's how I, and, and I've, I'm also one of these people that you should always list, you know, was it a lead, supporting, over five, under five, but if you have a named character, I put it next to that as well. So if I'm John, you know, as a, as a, as a cameo, I'll put those two pieces of information, meaning that's my name when you look it up in the credits. I actually did have a name. I think that's important. Good. Okay, well, let's go to some questions because I know we don't have a whole lot of time here. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, just real quick, Sean, if you could repeat, uh, we've got several people asking for you to repeat that website where you can find uh, book work. Uh, the ACX? Book work. Oh, sure. It's ACX. A as in Apple, C as in Charlie, X as in x-ray.com. That's one place to look. Um, and, and I would also strongly recommend for anybody listening who's thinking about this to join LinkedIn.com. It's free. It's a business, sort of business version of Facebook. And once you're a member of LinkedIn, to start typing in the search engine, uh, audio book groups or voiceover groups. There's about 10 different, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, groups on LinkedIn. And when I tell my students and the actors who come to my technique class, I say to them, go on there and join those threads and just 
you don't have to necessarily participate. You can read, though. You can actually see people going, hey, I uh, just landed this book on ACX, but I'm not sure about this certain issue. Can I have anybody help me? And suddenly, some big-time producer out of New York or L.A. who does audio books for Random House or, or uh, you know, books on tape might jump in and answer your question for you. I think those threads, those, those, uh, those social networking threads are an excellent way to begin to uh, ask questions and find out more about the, uh, the audio book business. Fantastic. Uh, last question from Tiffany. What do you put on a resume when you're first starting right at the beginning? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Uh, well, Tiffany, you and Meryl Streep and Denzel Washington all had something in common. When all of you have started, you had zero credits on your resume. <laughs> and so you've got to start somewhere, right? Um, I'm not sure how old you are, Tiffany, but if you're, you know, if you're in high school or in college and you're just starting out, go ahead, go ahead and put those high school and college performance credits on your resume, or even if you've just done a few classes, that's okay. Just list them as such. Um, you know, if you walk into an audition as an 18-year-old and all you've got on your resume are high school credits, maybe even grade school, you know, some classes you've taken, that's okay because the producer and the director are expecting that. They don't expect you to have, you know, off-Broadway or Broadway or major TV and film credits. You go with what you have. You know, and over time, as you get more more credits and more things to choose from, then you can begin to tailor the resume toward each uh, audition. But don't be afraid to put your, you know, when you're first starting out. I did, you know, I put my high school and college credits on just after I got out of school, and and that was okay because once again, they were expecting that. That they weren't, you know, looking down their nose at me because that's all I had. They knew at 21 that's what I should have on my resume. And the other thing too is, you know, if you have special skills that can make you very marketable, those would be very helpful things to put in there. You know, do you play uh, uh, certain sports? Do you speak foreign languages? Can you believably do different dialects? Can you uh, contort your body and fit into a suitcase? Uh, you know, whatever can help sell you. Those are the kinds of things you can put in there, and certainly if you've taken some classes, at least that way people might see, well, you know, she hasn't had much experience, but boy, she's taken some great classes, and that can be very helpful to you as well. But I think most importantly, and this is for everybody, be honest on your resume. There, there have been horror stories that I've heard about where people figured, well, who's really going to know if I did this play? Don't lie on your resume, because your resume doesn't get you the job. You know, you're, it's going to be your your look and your audition. That's what gets you the job. So don't run your business, um, you know, by lying about a resume. It's not a good way to run your business. Two quick things, Aaron. The first thing I would like to tell everybody out there is I have a YouTube channel. It's my shameless plug for the afternoon. Um, Actually, it's a great one, by the way. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, If you go on YouTube and look for Sean Allen Pratt or Sean Pratt Presents, you'll find my channel. And I've got about, oh, I think, 30 or 40 videos, and the majority of them are on the actor's resume, and they go into far more detail than we have time to go into today here. Um, and I would strongly advise you to go on, look at the videos, they're free, and you'll see that there's a wealth of information that uh, I really get into the nitty-gritty of resume design and layout and, inf and things to put on and uh, take off your resume. But just to pick up one last note about what you said about lying on your resume, the irony is, of course, it's not necessarily saying you did a show, that kind of lie, that will come back and bite you in the butt. The lies that really get you are when you say you can speak fluent French when actually you took it back in high school and it's been seven years since you've spoken a word, or that you can horseback ride, but you really haven't taken lessons since you were a teenager, or that you, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you can you you're, you know how to be a, an actor combatant, which you've only taken maybe one workshop in sword fighting. Those things might actually be the tipping point about you getting the job or not. So if you show up on the set and they hand you the script and it's all in French, and you walk out there to speak your first lines and you're stumbling through them, that's when the lie comes back to haunt you, or you realize you're going to have to be on horseback for this scene for eight hours at a dead gallop, you know, running through. A, a, you know, a combat scene, you know, it's a Civil War movie or something. Those are the lies that come back to haunt you, not necessarily that you did a little play somewhere. It's the lies that say you can do something when you really can't. 
Absolutely. Hey, Sean, I want to thank you so much. Uh, this information was wonderful. All of your contact information is uh, right on everybody's monitor. Definitely go to his website. If you get a chance to take any of Sean's classes, they are wonderful. And he's right, the YouTube channel is great. I've forwarded a number of them um, to, to people because I think they're so helpful. So thank you very much, and uh, look forward to talking with you soon, Sean. You guys have a great day. Thank you, Aaron.